Welcome everybody to this World Satsanga held on the 26th of May 2018 in conjunction with Kevin Moore and The Moore Show. And uh, you can find Kevin Moore's work on YouTube, on his YouTube channel. Just look up uh, The Moore Show and you'll be able to find all the information about all the interviews he's done and all the work he's done to date with the work on the um, documentary he's, he's working on called, uh, they, they call them channelers. And uh, <clears throat> this is an excellent piece of work. And last time I spoke to Kevin, he was in Chicago finishing off some of the work there. Um, incidentally, Kevin uh, has invited myself to work with him a little bit on the uh, exposition that's going to take place in Manchester on the 23rd of June, which is called um, Awakening UFO and Conscious Life Expo. That's in Manchester again. And uh, for those of you in the UK, that's a very good thing to go and see. Both myself and um, Kevin will be t talking. Uh, I'll be on stage with Kevin just to give a little bit of insight in terms of what I've picked up about uh, sort of aliens and conscious living, so to speak, in terms of the, the channel work I've done with some of my books and, and information that's, that's happened intermediate to that. Okay, so if you're in the UK and you've got the time, 23rd of June at the Awakening UFO and Conscious Life Expo in Manchester is a very good thing to go and see. It's going to be a good, a good weekend, of no doubt, with lots of different speakers, lots of different information, lots of, obviously lots of bookstalls, that sort of stuff as well. So uh, you can go and see Kevin and myself as well. Fantastic. That'll be a great weekend. Okay, let's get on with the rest of the satsanga then. So go first onto the agenda. So today I'm going to talk about the genres of OM, okay, the uncreated creations. Uh, and then I've got uh, around 25 to 30 minutes or even more of questions. We've got a good diversity of questions this month. So it's, uh, it's going to be interesting for people to, to listen to this. And um, then we're going to do an end of meet or end of uh, satsanga meditation to repair a body part or organ. Um, now that will be based upon the work that I've done myself in terms of healing people. And although my preliminary healing um, education, if you want to call it that, was, was based upon the first generation student of one of Barbara Brennan's uh, classes. And, and it's, uh, it's this information uh, and the way of healing, in this, in the, the way I'm going to describe, is something that I've been given by source myself. So it, these things evolve. As you, as you work through healing, you're given, you're given more details, more information, how to deal with people in a, a bespoke way when you need to work with them in a bespoke way because a lot of healing techniques are very generalized and people generally need to have a, a, a healing that is specific to their requirements, their psycho-spiritual requirements and their um, gross physical and spiritual physical requirements as well. So this is just a, a visualization technique to help you heal a part or repair a part or replace a part. Okay, so we'll go through that. Okay, so let's go to the, the first part which is the, the genres of OM. There are um, four genres of OM. Now the OM are a, a group of sentient entities that were created as a function of the origins reuse of sentient energy from its experiment in trying to reproduce itself and therefore trying to accelerate its own um, evolutionary progression through experience and learning um, in, a, in, a, in a rapid way. Now, clearly, it, clearly, if you read the books, you'll see that, that that's that, that failed because how can the origin recreate itself when it doesn't know itself at all? So it's difficult to do that, of course. So it reused that energy to create the source entities. One of those source entities being our source entity, our creator, if you want to call it. That's our God. So we are, and the true energetic cells or our higher cells, God heads or over souls that um, that are part of us and, and the, the bit that's in the incarnate bodies now is, is a smaller aspect of that or a shard. Um, read the books to see more detail, uh, specifically the and dialogues because that goes into great detail there, um, are, a, are a function of, of, of the source entities. So the um are a, are a different category basically. When the, the origin created the source entities by reusing this this sentient energy and then reassigning a sentience that is more, shall I say, reporting into the origin, um, a, a lower level of sentience, not, not an equal level of sentience. If you think about the, the origins being, the, the, the 12 origins being created by the origin, they were given the same level of sentience, the same level of ability, everything. The, the, the source entities are 
for want of a better word, subservient to the origin because they're working independently of the origin, but for the origin in terms of their uh, understanding of self within the origin and its structure and its energies and, 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 the, and all the different aspects associated with it. To experience, learn and evolve and create the evolutionary progression which they experience and so does the origin. But in this process of using one type of sentient level versus another type of sentient level, the the two didn't mix. It's a bit like oil and water. You can't create something that stays together uh, without being separated. Specifically, if it is something which is completely different, you know, oil and water chemically are different, so that they, the molecules don't bind together. So that, that happened the same with the, with the arm. So the arm were created as a function of something else being created. So the arm are a an uncreated creation, so to speak, and they are sentience which is of the same level of the origin, but of a smaller weight, if you want to call it that, a, 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 a smaller volume, a much smaller volume, clearly, <laughs> microscopically or, or micro, micro, microscopically smaller than, than, the, than the origin. But, they are, but because of what they are, because their origin with equal, you know, equality, so to speak, they operate independently of the origin. And although the origin ultimately would have, I, I, I guess, would have control of them if they, if, if, if it wanted to. In essence, it, it doesn't, and it, and it, it doesn't decide to do that. I mean, but they, they, they are what they are. They will migrate into the origins' next sectors of sentience when this particular area of polyomniscient sentient self-awareness is fully mapped out, um, and do their own thing. So they will not be, you know part of the bigger plan of, of, of what the, what, what's in store for the source entities and what's in store for our true energetic selves. So they operate independently. And, and also, Am are fairly unique in so much as they are outside of the evolutionary cycle. They stay, they stay outside of the evolutionary cycle because being part of the evolutionary cycle includes a level of creativity. And when, you're, when you create something, you end up being responsible for that creation. And so they don't want to be responsible for the creation. And so things like the Purum, for instance, aren't, well, they, they stay away from, thing, from creativity of any sort because once they, start, once they create something, they're responsible for it. And it's difficult to remove that level of responsibility for something you've created um, when that creation has to be maintained, for instance, or managed in some way, shape, or form. Okay, so there's four, actually there's five, because there was something that came out towards the end of the, of the Origin Speaks book that indicates that the creation of, of, of another um, small, much smaller group of OM, but I'll come to that right at the very end. There's four main groups that we know about, know about now, and this, this, the emergence of this fifth group of OM. So the first group are actually, um, I'm going to work from the top down so we can understand it in, in, a, in a sort of a holistic way and then focus down on what happens in the source entities uh, in structural environment. The pure OM, are uh, um, that are totally omniscient from their own perspective and they are totally created from origin energy and origin level sentience and they are totally independent of the origin they move around they're all of the origins um, area of poly omniscient sentient self-awareness totally freely doing what they want to do they are totally independent of anything and everything. They don't get involved with any source entities, although one or two might do, just for interest. But in essence, they, they, they've got their own things to do and, they, and, they, and they're experiencing things in their own way. They're not, they're not in, involved with the evolutionary cycle, as I've just said. They are totally independent. They are, if you want to call it that, micro mini versions of origin, if you want to call it that. The next level then is called non-captive. <coughs> Now, a non-captive arm is an arm that may associate itself with a source entity, but is not totally, not as pure. It doesn't have the same level of sentient weight, if you want to call that, you know, volume or mass of sentience that a pure arm does. So a non-captive arm would gravitate around, but not within, the energies associated with a source entity. So they're, fa they're fairly similar to, to a pure arm, but they just don't have this same sentient mass, this same sentient weight, so to speak. And, and they they do their own thing, but they do work in conjunction with um, some of the source entities 
should they decide to do so. And so they can, if they desire, move in and out of the energies associated with a particular source entity and its own structural environment within itself and that which it creates. So they are, they are non-captive, they can move into the energies of a source entity, well the Purom can as well, but they don't, but Purom generally don't, or, or, or mostly don't actually, but the, but the non-captive arm do. But the level of sentience associated with a non-captive arm is, is lower than, than that with a pure arm. Then there's a, a captive arm. Now a captive arm is, it's basically an arm that is, that has enough sentience, or enough sentient mass to be arm, but is not, doesn't have enough sentient weight to be able to remove itself from the energies associated with a source entity. So in the creative condition, um, when, the, when, when the origin created the source entities, the pure arm split out and became themselves, the non-captive arm split out and became themselves but became gravitated towards a source entity, the captive arm re remained within the energies of a, of a source entity. So they didn't have enough mass to sort of pop to the surface, so to speak, and become separated or become individualized totally. totally. So they are, again, they are, they are um, uh, origin sentience, but not of the, the, the right level of weight to enable them to move outside of the environment that, that, is, that they're captive within. So that's what they call captive arm. They're, they're, they are stuck within the, the structural environment uh, of a particular source entity. Now a non-captive arm can, and a, a pure arm can, should they decide to do so, temporarily take a captive arm outside of the energies of a source entity. But that takes a lot of energy and so it doesn't tend to happen an awful lot. And, then, and, the, and the captive arm would have to, because of its association with the source entity, move back into that environment. There's a, it's, it's almost like taking an organ out of a body. You know, you take an organ out of a body, and once it's out of that body, it can be, uh, it won't work properly, so to speak. It, it, you can put it into another body, but the, the other body will have the, poten the potential to reject the organ. So the, 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 the body, you know, the organ is typed to the body that it's in. So, it's, so that's a, the similar sort of thing that, it, that, that happens there. The level of sentient weight is associated with a particular source entity, and so it's, it's, it's almost like that's part of its signature as well. So it prefers to work within, uh, naturally it tends to prefer to work within those energies that are part of the, um, the source entity that, is, that it ended up being part of when it gained its own, its own level of awareness, so to speak. And then there's a hybrid arm. Now a hybrid arm is again stuck within or captive within the energies of a source entity, but because the sentient weight is drastically reduced, it sort of blends in with the energies of, a, of, of the true energetic selves that, are sent, that a, a source entity created. And so what we have here, again, if you use, if you use the, the oil and water scenario, what you've got here is a case where the, the level of oil is so small that it actually does get broken down by the water and it emulsifies. So it's a similar sort of thing. And so what we get is a, uh, a number of entities uh, who are incarnate or, or have true energetic selves within, within a source entity that have a very small percentage of om sentience or om sentient energy associated with what they are. Um, let's say it's like 3% or 4% or, or, or you know, the maximum I've seen is about 13%. It would, it, I'm being told it doesn't go above 15% because after that you start to become captive on. So it's, um, it's, you, know, you start to have enough, enough sentient weight there, so to speak, to become your own energy in, in, your, in your own right, so to speak, as, as, as an OM. So the hybrid OMs are those where there's a very small percentage of, of OM uh, or origin sentient energy um, mixed in with and blended in with the the rest of the sentient energy associated with the source entity to create that which becomes a true energetic self. Okay, so those are the four main main versions of arm. The, <coughs> these these this information is within the um, the book the the um, 
Beyond the Source 2 and within the Origin Speaks as well. And I think I mentioned it a little bit in the, in the AND dialogues, but um, it's, it's, it's all there in, in a bit more detail. Now this fifth version of ARM that I'm, I've just alluded to is, is a bit unique because it comes out of, it came out of the, 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 uh, the book The Origin Speaks right towards the very end, sort of around the, uh, what page would it be, something like 316. But what, what's happened here is, is that, and I was a bit concerned about this at the time because there's a number of different coincidences that occur when I'm talking to the origin or the source entity where things that wouldn't have happened sort of happened and I was a bit sort of worried whether this was sort of me contriving it. Um, I, was, I was actually put, put on the right path a number of times by, by source or, or, or by the origin to say actually these things have already happened so you just happen to be logging into them. You happen to be sort of logging into a certain event space that shows that you've experienced that which is which has already happened but from your perspective as a human being it's it, it's it hasn't happened yet so the vagaries of, of event space coming into play there but what I'm being shown here is that there was a, an even smaller amount of sentient energy which still remained separated out from but still it but was still was very very pure um, from the, you know, separated out from the origin in, in the creation process, remains separated from the source entities, but still remains, um, you know, individualized. But it was so small, it, it was unspottable, basically. But what, what the origin noticed was that the, there was areas of this very, very fine microparticles of, of, of um, origin sentience, which was individualized as a function of this, you know, reuse of energy to create the source entities, that, was starting to collect together, so these these om that these other five om that that the origin has discovered um, are becoming slightly bigger and bigger because they are going around and sort of attracting, or should I say, hoovering up those other finer particles to create a a, a, a higher level of sentient weight or mass, so to speak, and so the. So these things will grow to a point where I'm being told they're going to be a little bit in between non-captive arm and pure arm in terms of their their sentient weight, but they are, for want of a better word, se separated out in something else. They're like this, this in-between uh, entity that is still individualised and still pure arm, but it's not as it's not as great in its, in its sentient weight as, as, as the pure arm or the non-captive arm. It's in, it's in between the two. And the origin, I'm told, is very excited that there's, that there's five more arm, because there's not many arm, as you can imagine, um, and that these five arm are going to do their own thing. They are, the, the, the origin tells me, didn't notice them, but it must have done, because the, the, the origin is uh, omniscient and omnipresent. So it's, um, it, it, it's, Again, it's a function of me asking the right questions at the right time. But it's right now the these these larger dust particles are hoovering up these smaller on dust particles to create these larger these larger on beings, which are I'm being told just moving around the edges. I'm just seeing a picture now that they're moving around the edges, the higher levels of structure of the origin's current volume from the court that of polyomniscient sentient self-awareness so they're right up the top of this of the structure of the of the um of the origin i'm just um, sorry for sort of stopping my my my, uh, my speech there it probably made, made you thought the recording was, was stopping but in essence they are they're looking around they, they, they're, they're, they've not got much work to do now they've almost if you imagine a very fine dust particle in space trying to find an even finer dust particle at the other side of a galaxy or the other side of a universe. That's about what's going on with these things. They're using their own sentience to tap into any sentience anomalies within the origin, i.e. individualized sentience that is unaware, but is still, but is still individualized from the origin itself. And, and, they, and they're going around and hoovering this up and, they, and they're very clever actually as I'm being shown they're not being they're not being um, selfish in what they're doing is that each of them is sharing out what each what each, what, what, what each other is taking so 
For instance, there's five of these on that has emerged or has evolved as a result of the, this, these fine dust particles of omsentience or origin sentience um, sort of grouping together and creating a bigger, a bigger volume of, 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 of origin sentience or OM. And uh, so if, if, if there's like, let's call it 10 grams, they, one, and one of them gets like six grams, another one gets four grams, they share it out between them all, so they all get two grams each. So they're all growing at the same size at the same time. So it's uh, it's quite interesting. This is they're very they're very grouped together. They they work the, the arm do work together. They are they they are beloved of each other, so to speak. They they are a, um, an individualized collective sentience that has individualized free will, but they recognise themselves as being what they are. So they they operate together. Um, it's like an uncollective collective, if you want to call it that. That that is totally free to do whatever they want to do, but they choose to be together. Um, the, and these are, and these operate in a sim similar way, but I'm being told that they they're not really bothered about being involved with other on. They are work, they're going to do their own thing. So here we go. Uh, there's, that's that's the fifth the fifth level of on. You can read about those in the, in the Origin speaks, but it's um, just to let you know that there are the, the, from my perspective the four major um, genres of on plus this fifth genre, which is sort of emerging, so to speak, as being totally ind individualised and independent of any other OM that, that are there as well. Okay, so that's the, the work on the, on the OM and the different genres. Let's go and have a look at the questions we've got now. And there's, there's quite a few questions come through, and I'm, I'm very pleased that, with the diversity as well. So the first question is from that uh, wonderful lady, US, who does the, the transcriptions for you all. So those of you who have trouble to listen to the recordings or... Um, uh, have, have technology challenges or are able to print out the transcriptions and give them to those who, who don't have computers. Uh, which I, th I thank her very much. These are the questions uh, from her. And the questions are, my readers are very interested in knowing more about autism. So here they are. My friends used to say that autists are the child of the sun. Spiritual intelligence and connectivity have nothing to do with autism. You're supposed to go higher and not lower. To me, autism is going lower, not higher. Just because they are sentient and have special abilities doesn't make them more advanced human beings. They are silenced because they can't express themselves and they have special abilities because they need to categorise everything everyone does. I don't think Buddha was an, was an autist or Jesus or Osho or any other spiritual master. Autists are just autists. Uh, they're not ch children of the sun. We all are. Nobody is. Um, I'm just logging into this saying, children of the sun. It's, it's sort of one way of saying that they are pure. Um, they are sort of stuck in a level of connectivity that they can, can't use properly because everybody around them is um, <laughs> deaf, dumb and blind, basically. Those are other individuals who are... Uh, more awake and aware will naturally communicate under the channels and so autist, uh, autistic individuals will pick up on this and gravitate towards them but in real terms they, they, they're almost limited by their abilities their abilities are special abilities and they are, and they are, and they are more, certainly more connected and, and certainly more omniscient if you want to call it that than the average, than the average incarnate individual who is you know, immersed in their in their incarnation, but they they are limited by this lack of connected lack of communicative ability with others. They can communicate with other autistic individuals on a, on a fairly high way and in a very intuitive way, but in, when it comes down to being associated with um, the rest of incarnate society, so to speak, they have difficulty communicating. So they appear to be of a lower frequency. They're not the lower frequencies. It's just that they've they've got this. Level of communicative ability that relies that relies more on um, clear clear sentience, so to speak. I mean, omniscient was probably the wrong word. Clear sentience is a better word than than just you know to, to cosmic knowingness, if you want to call it that, or or or, uh, or spiritual knowingness, more than logic or education, so to speak. They can they can log into it and they don't understand how 
we can work things out when they, when they can do it instantaneously. They have no capacity for um, using the way that we use uh, and understand the way we use, although they do categorise things and they like to sort of sort things out in a very structured way. They like to, that's the only way they can interface with us actually, I'm being told, is to try to categorise things because they experience things in a more holistic way. The only way they can understand what we're doing is to categorise things, pigeonhole things, log them down, put them in a matrix, those sort of things. So it's all to do with the ability to communicate and, and our actual inability to communicate with them on the sort of levels and the frequencies that they do. The next question is um, based upon <coughs> um, a sort of generalised question actually and it uh, goes this way, it said um, you said the event space is not sentient any longer uh, as a function of event space giving up its sentience to allow a, a much bigger entity evolve, that being the origin it's not even conscious, it's just intelligence but if event space is what creates all the parallel conditions for all our parallel lives to explore by manipulating energies and frequencies then isn't event space sentient by default because it's got creativity uh, it's, because it is creativity as its best at its best or what are, am I missing here okay um, well the creation of other event spaces event streams and event bubbles are a function of what we do and the parallel conditions that are also created as a function of that are also a function of what we do. Um, that is, that is being beings who are in the who are in the creative uh, and evolutionary cycle. That is. So, event space uh, has an automatic trigger that triggers things by just having enough intelligence to be able to work out when there's a a need for a, for a an alternative existence to allow a series of events to happen upstream, upstream to, in supporting it and downstream to support it later um, to allow a different series, series of events to occur and there, therefore allow different levels of experience to occur independently of those would, that, that would have happened if there was a different choice being made. So it's not not so much as not so much intelligence sentience is there. It's more of an automatic function based upon a, a, a necessary level of intelligence to allow that automatic function to occur. So it, sentience doesn't play a part in this because sentience is a function of being creative. And although one could argue that the creation of, a, of another event space is is creativity in its own right, actually it's just a separation of and a duplication of an existing environment. So it's not, create, it's not creativity per se, creativity with a view to experience something, learn and evolve from something, and then modify that experience and, and re-understand re it. It's simply creation of, a new, of another environment and, and to allow those entities that are within it to also experience, learn and evolve in, in that parallelized or c concurrent state. So it's more of an automatic function rather than rather than rather than a an, an intelligently understanding, knowing, and creative function. There's a, there's a, there's a big difference there. So it's it, it, think think of it in terms of something which is created in, in an automatic way. Okay. So next question is um, probably going to be more difficult to answer. <laughs> it said, I talk about spherical event space. Why is it spherical like a bubble and not um, amoeboid or irregular or shape-shifting? Is it spherical within our multiverse because the universe is arranged in nested spheres within spheres and because our so sentient energy takes a spherical form here? Um, the word spherical is just something that's being used to describe a condition that we can understand. Clearly, if I said amorphous, there would be no anchor point, there would be no datum for us to use. So we have to use something we can work with. And when we start, to be, when we can base our level of education that on, that upon a stepping stone that allows us to understand uh, holistically what we're experiencing, what, what, we're, what we're being told or educated in, then we can move on to a different level of understanding. Now, <clears throat> there are event space bubbles so to speak, and that information is within the new book, the, the Curators, which 
he's, he's in the first draft and he's um, going through its final editing phase right now and it should be presented to the, or the, the publishers by August this year and hopefully on the shelves by August next year. So, you, so the, the, there's more of a description of what that is there and, and more of an understanding. But um, event space bubbles are, 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 are a different way of thinking because event space bubbles are where things are contained within a certain event space, if you want to call that. There's like, there's like a, an event space bubble is sort of an individualized um, series of events which don't go anywhere. They sort of stay where they are, so to speak, and don't move on too much. Um, I'm, I'm sure there'll be a better expl explanation within the, the book, the, uh, the, the, the curators. And I might just have a quick look to see what the description is. Okay, so I'll just refresh my memory. <laughs> Actually, this is in the, the glossary at the back of the, uh, the curators. And um, I said event space bubble, but this is classified as an event stream bubble. So if you think of the event space, or spherical representation of event space as being a self-contained group of events rather than leading from one to another. This is something else. So an event stream bubble is where each event is a bubble of interaction between an entity or being and its environment that it's working within. The bubbles or events can grow and explode into another bubble or shrink and implode into nothingness. Bubbles that grow sometimes explode into another bubble that is nearby creating a new but combined bubble. They can explode into a new bigger bubble allowing them to cope with an expansion of event fractals that are all uh, that, that are still combined together in the space, the event space which was created for the original and static event stream. Those bubbles of events that shrink and implode either disappear totally, thus representing an end of that particular event stream, or they implode and reappear within another event. When a bubble has naturally ended its usefulness, it implodes back into its originating event stream bubble. So there's a bit of explanation there for you all. Uh, but, it, but in essence, if you think of it in terms of collective environments, I mean, the, the, a, an event space being spherical is, is, I mean, I sometimes describe the universe as being spherical, but actually say it's more amorphous than that. And actually, a bubble doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be round or spherical, does it? If you, if you get some uh, washing up liquid and uh, in, in some water and then use, and then use a, a hoop and then blow through the hoop with the, wash, with the washing up water um, within that small hoop, you'll, you'll gain uh, an elongated bubble, so to speak. So this, so this particular shape of, a, of an event space bubble um, is based upon that which the entities within it do and the, the work that the different event streams within it are, are working with and different micro event spaces as well. So there's lots and lots of things going on there that, 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 that will help to explain that. But, but in essence, it, it's, even, our, even our energy isn't particularly spherical. You know, when people say, oh, I've, I've done astral traveling and I look like a sphere. Well, that's the only thing you can relate to in terms of, in terms of, a, of, of, of sentience associated with energy. It, it, you know, lack of gravity create, allows water to become a sphere because it, it, it's, its uh, surface tension creates a, sphere, you know, a, a spheroid, so to speak. We could create whichever form we wanted to with our, with our sentient energy when disincarnate or, or astral traveling. It's just that the sphere just happens to be a comfortable and, a, and, a, and an understandable form, form that we can use. So in, so in real terms, the spherical event space doesn't necessarily need to be totally spherical. It can be whatever it needs to be to support the expansion and contraction of events within, of event streams um, within that particular event space. Um, but that event space bubble is usually individualized and doesn't connect with other event spaces to create a, a wider event, uh, event stream. Okay, well, I hope that helps that particular question. Okay, next one is, um, are there other, any other famous on beings that we know from history, such as Paramahansa Yogananda? I think people would like to know about them too. Um, no, I, don't, I, I had a look at this question before I went into even starting the recording of the satsanga, and I, I didn't feel there were any more, really. Um, there's, it's, the Om don't want to incarnate, full stop. <laughs> and although I've been told I'm an Om, and uh, you know, even though you're incarnate, you you still have to follow the same rules as everybody else. I'm also told that the, the rest of the Om that I'm part of 
think I'm completely raving mad. So why would I want to go into low frequencies? It's just, you know, it's, it's so potentially um, addictive and karma creating, it would be, be a, a total distraction. So the answer is that there, in general, aren't any OM uh, that are famous individuals, pure OM I'm talking about now. So um, there are hybrid, obviously hybrid OM who have, who have become um, noteworthy in terms of the work they've done on the earth and other, and other, and other environments within, within this physical universe and uh, other frequencies within the physical universe. Um, and that's the same with captive on, but in terms of non-captive on, I'm not, I'm not seeing anything there at all. So I, d I actually don't know of any. I mean, perhaps maybe I would take this away and do some meditation on it and see if I can pick out if there, if there is in fact anything there that shows me that, the, that there are other uh, evidence for other individuals or other individualized leaders um, for both political and uh, spiritual means who would, who would um, stand out as being particularly related to OM energy. Okay, so I might have to go back and do that. Okay, next question is from DT and it's, um, I've been thinking over a question from my next sex Sanger. Well, thank you very much. It developed when I was rereading The Origin Speaks and The Origin was describing how event space almost erased itself by creating linearity. So this is my question. Does linearity exist anywhere within our source senses creations? I mean, we see time is linear, but Cryon says that it is more circular. How does that compute with you? Um, well, time doesn't exist, and Cryon saying it's circular, in my understanding, is saying that really it's spherical. <laughs> um, amorphous, an amorphous sphere, just to answer the question that's about to come from the previous uh, questioner. So, Everything is concurrently existing in the same in the same space, okay. And if you, I'm going to go back to the very first explanation of of event space um, that uh, that that entity called Byron gave me a long, long time ago, when it said that you can think of event space as a rubber band ball. Now we've all made rubber band balls, but we've got lots and lots of rubber bands and wrap them together to create a ball. And those of you who've taken a golf ball apart would understand that golf balls are made of uh, you know, not, not rubber bands, but a continuous string of rubber all wrapped together. Or they used to be before they became solid. Um, so, but a rubber band ball is basically rubber bands, okay? So if you think of what Cryon said, it means the time is circular, and you think of an event space as being one of those rubber bands, Okay, or the events within an event space being one of those rubber bands, a rubber band generally is circular. So what you have is, a, is a, an explanation which is almost there, but not quite. So Cryon's giving us, if Cryon knows more about the greater reality than, he's, than, 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 he's, than we're able to digest, then he will give us part of that information until we can understand that and then move on to the next level. This is how we, this is how we learn and evolve. You know, it's how we go through school and it's how our guides work with us. We get to a certain level of, of education with one particular teacher, and then when we've reached that level of education, then we can move on to the next level of education with a new teacher. And this is the same with spiritual teachers as well. And it's the same with me. Or, whoops, when people understand my work, somebody else will come along with a deeper level of in information and understanding and people will move on to that as well. So each event um, within, a, within a, the overall event space is like a rubber band wrapped around each other. So, and so each event within the event space is in contact either directly through direct contact with another rubber, with another rubber band or indirectly through contact via other rubber bands. And so everything is in contact directly or indirectly, or should we say in contact <laughs> in some way to make this, this spherical condition. And so that's, that, that's, that's the, that's the description of it. So Cryon's description is based upon one small stepping stone towards the to the, 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 a, more, a more deeper understanding. Okay, so that's, that's good. That's, that's a very good question. Next one's from BP. Sometimes I feel embarrassed being here on earth. Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, and others have provided mankind with profound knowledge and demonstrations. Yet hundreds of years have transpired without mankind making any significant spiritual pro pro uh, progress. Instead, we have non-stop war culminating in the horrific 20th century wars. Okay. In the present day, 
we have more profound knowledge coming through you, uh, that's, this is me, and others, and yet humankind continues to remain stuck in the mud. Just look at the behaviour in the United States, which has become psychotic polarised society, or the never-ending turmoil in the Middle East, or the disasters in Venezuela, Cuba, North Korea, and many African nations. Humankind continues to be completely victimised by its own hand, and of course blame it on everybody else, including God. Not too spiritual if you ask me. The question is, why is this place such a quagmire? Why is humankind so dimwitted, or is the Earth experience always going to be like this? Sort of a perpetual elementary school for us lesser lights to enable us to move up the evolutionary scale elsewhere. And has the church been a key enabler to, to so-called human condition by preaching for hundreds of years that we're nothing but unworthy sinners, only whose recourse is to beg for God's mercy and completely contrary to the teachings of Buddha, Jesus and Muhammad. Um, basically, we've put ourselves where we are through the use of individualised free will and becoming addicted to, um, in effect, being selfish. <laughs> the, the function of being incarnate gives us almost total separation from that which we truly are, our true energetic self, and obviously part of source. And so that becomes part of our experience. And collectively we experience this separation together, and we work together in some way, shape or form to, to create an environment where we can experience various different levels of experience within this. The issue is that the free will has allowed us to become addicted to low frequency thoughts, behaviours and actions and yeah, become selfish and, and self-centred and materialistic. The issue of, of, of teaching what, who and what we are from masters, such as the Buddha, uh, Muhammad and Jesus, um, has also been prostituted and, and manipulated by people to create power for themselves. And so really saying my school is better than your school is nonsense because they all, if you go back to the very start of the, the teachings of, of these masters, they all, and, and Yogananda as well, and, and Sri Ekteshwar, and uh, um, uh, the Hiri Mahasha, and, and Babaji, and all these different individuals who disappear into, the, into different event spaces, um, were all pure at one point. They were all different ways of achieving the same thing. Not one was better than the other. They were just different angles. There were different keys that opened the same door. Okay? The thing is that mankind in its low frequential state started to believe that one was better than the other or one was more in tune than the other. And so there was um, friction created between them. And so we create a level of competition which is low frequency. We don't, we, you know, competition is a low frequency condition because it's trying to make one person better than the other. You know, and we, re we revel in this. I mean, everything we do in sport is competitive, isn't it, if you think of it? So it, the whole thing is perpetuated. We go in circles of, um, of self-centeredness and uh, status and, and mater material desirability. But this is all to do with you know, free will. At some point, we will move out of this. When we have moved beyond this point of, of, of desire of being self-supporting, self so to speak, and we start to realise that the bigger picture is to help each other, to help others, then we'll move out of this and, we'll be, and we, will, we will become that which these, these masters, these enlightened masters, uh, were trying to teach us to be and trying to give us the ways and directions to move into. And so, from that perspective, we will move forwards, uh, but we have to do it in a way where when we reincarnate, we, we clearly we know it when we disincarnate, but when we reincarnate, we start to realize this and work together. This will happen um, eventually. There will be a, for, a function of critical mass because you know, when we get um, a number of individuals who are working together like, that are like-minded, they attract other individuals of like mind. And although the, the function of critical mass won't automatically cause a switch, it will start to affect the thoughts, behaviours and actions of others who are thinking in a more lower frequency way. So it, it'll start to spread on a, on a direct line and a, and a volume based triangulation basis, which is, and triangulation is something I've described in previous satsangas. So it will happen that we work through our own free will, uh, first of all embracing um, self-centeredness and, and 
and materialism and then rejecting it and then moving forward and becoming more more spiritually orientated but it will take quite a bit of, quite a bit of time if you look at this if you, if you look at the example of the um the old story of uh, adam and eve and in the snake and the tree and the in the apple and the apple was basically free will um and man incarnate mankind chose free will over god's will um man thought that working to God's will or the source's will was going to constrain it and going to limit it but actually we would have had unlimitedness had we chosen God's will uh, so with the, <laughs> the the shiny jewel of free will blinding though blinding the the um, the ability to understand as working in God's will is a higher function we chose we chose free will but that free will will eventually result in us becoming more understanding of a collective function um, over, over a period of event spaces, time if you want to call it that, and we will start to become working more in God's will eventually collectively together, uh, not just as a, as a location for incarnation on a planet called Earth, but across the whole of the, the lower frequencies and the, the upper frequencies associated with the physical universe. Okay, so I hope that, uh, this, that answers that particular question. Next question is from DC. Um, does origin the source or the source entity or even other higher spiritual beings ever exhibit human qualities such as anger, disappointment or disencourage disencouragement? I, su I suspect the answer is no. However, when we look at all the hard work we are doing to improve our Earth uh, and there are some setbacks such as Atlantis, Lemuria and Maldek and all the nonsense and the shenanigans that we have gotten ourselves into over our time here to event spaces, how did they see the setbacks um, or am I seeing this as a complete as as a, as a human with an ego? I've heard it said that reality unfolding is always perfect, and that is God's will for us. Um, actually, very interesting question, and I really do thank you for this because actually, the source and obviously ultimately origin experiences all of these things through us. So when we experience disappointment, anger, frustration, discouragement, rejection, acceptance, so does the source. And it experiences it in all the different ways, angles, directions, and intensities that we all individually and collectively experience it. So it does experience it, but it experiences it in a way which is not going to affect it. Um, I mean, our experience is minute, is, is, is more, is, you know, is, is significantly less than minute in, in reality. And so it's not going to affect the overall. Um, personality of our true energetic selves let alone that which the which, which the source is and so we experience these things but it's recorded as being an experience rather than a an in-depth e e um, emotional response and so it's it's understood known recorded logged and that's it it goes it, it, it doesn't affect the, the source but the source does through us our own experiences experience it as well concurrently so everything everything that we're experiencing our true energetic self and therefore source experiences concurrently and that's every part of us who's who is so all the different aspects projected aspects into the physical universe and the shards from those projected aspects and the primary and secondary incarnations as well uh, and the parallel versions and in different event spaces they're all created and, and, and explode and implode are all experienced concurrently by a true energetic self and therefore they're all experienced by by, by source so if you, if you think of all these things happening all the time you can see how, how small a momentary um, feeling of disappointment or anger or concern or worry or anxiety is in the bigger picture it's just a, a, a and even though we think all oh, with all of these collective versions of ourselves it must be big actually it's no it, it's, it is nothing in comparison to what the, the source is but it does experience it. So it experiences it through us, not experience it itself. It's one of the reasons why we're here, which is, which is interesting because if, if we weren't here, the source wouldn't experience these things and therefore it wouldn't evolve in this particular way. So, good question and thank you very much for that. Next set of questions and the last set of questions are from JM. And the first one is based upon the History of God page 379. And it says that aliens make suggestions, quote, to help with a 
progress of technology. Are aliens the source for most of our technological breakthroughs, such as computer chips, medical devices, spacecraft, etc.? Um, they and those entities who remain disincarnate and work with the entities who are uh, open to suggestion, the source of some of our major technology leaps. Once we understand that technological leap in whichever direction it's going into, we can work on it ourselves and move forward ourselves. So they help us to move in directions along with other entities. Uh, so there are aliens, uh, so, well, there are other incarnate vehicles of a higher frequency and of this particular frequency who are working in the grace of God, so to speak, or the grace of the source, who are putting little nuggets in our way for us to use and, and, and understand and then use as a stepping stone to move further, further and forwards. And clearly there's a lot of technological progressions we've had in the recent 50, in the last 50 years that have been you know, quantum leaps really. So you can see that we, there's evidence there that we have had help in some way, shape or form, either from the guides and helpers of those entities who have come to bring things into light, such as um, Baird or Marconi or Edison, okay? Um, and there's others who've been, been given help through, again, suggestion through telepathic communication. Sometimes there are actual handing over of physical technology, but that's generally from, the, from those incarnate entities who are working for the higher good, who are based upon the third frequency, which is where we are now. Okay, so I hope that answers that question. Uh, next page, 380 in the History of God, uh, comments are, aliens are helping us develop machines that will enable us to tap into the limitless free energy that's available to us. So will any of us live to see an actual physical machine that will do this? Um, there are machines already available and they are hidden. <laughs> they are hidden for a number of different reasons. Um, one, the, there's a lot, uh, from a, and I'm not creating a conspiracy here, but there are very powerful companies who rely on fossil fuels, who don't want to lose their business to individualized machines, basically. Machines that you would be the size of a packing case that would, um, you know, provide enough power to light to, to energize a house for a year or two. It's not in their it's not in their um, uh, in their best interest to allow this to happen. But there are there are, there are there. There, 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 there there's a number of them there. Some of them are based upon hydrogen cracking. Some of them are based upon zero point energy. Some of them are based upon using the orgone, actually tapping into the orgone. Um, some of them are based on certain levels of sacred geometry. Um, there was one particular individual who was very good at um, using sacred geometry to create weather conditions changes. And, I'll, and I can't remember that gentle person's name, but it's an American chap and he was able to use the sacred geometry. Some of it rotated, some of it didn't. Uh, and, and it was not specifically sacred geometry per se, but that was the exterior uh, appearance of it. It was the types of materials that were, that were together that made that geometry work and create uh, what can what, the only way I can say it is like a, an etheric buffer that pushed the etheric function of the weather systems around and allowed the um, the grouping together of water particles that are that are sort of naturally randomly free in the air, creating clouds and cloud burst. Um, so the the, the technology is there. It's just that sometimes it's it's not sometimes it's not the right time for it to come, and sometimes it needs to have somebody involved who's got a bit more political clout, so to speak, to be able to push it forwards. And sometimes there needs to be enough demand as well from the world to be able to to, to allow these things to come forwards and and and, and proliferate. So they're there. Um, will we see it in our lifetime? I would like to think that some of us will. I feel that within the next 35, 36 years, we will start to see some of these things coming into fruition. Some of them are a bit, um, uh, specifically the ones we work with Orgone, free energy that's, uh, that, that, that's available in, the, in, in all, of, all parts of the physical universe and beyond, um, are a bit, shall I say, out of calibration and so they can create more damage in the, in the, energy, in, in the higher levels of frequency. Um, in, in terms of their harv in terms of harvesting energy, so they need, need to be they need to be refined to be able to be used more accurately and, and more usefully to us. Okay. Next question: In History of God, page 
427, the source entity still chuckles over the idea that human age, when can they, uh, when they could just command their bodies. Oh, sorry, I'll start again. The source entity still chuckles over the idea that the human age, when they, when they could just command their bodies to stay like that of a teenager for 500 years. Is it really that simple? Yes, I mean, Babaji's managed to do it. Um, Babaji is an unascended master and has decided to stay in the physical to help us uh, navigate through the physical and remo remove ourselves through the introduction of various different techniques, Kriya Yoga being one of them, to move beyond the need to incarnate. Um, when we were higher frequency uh, in, in several times gone past in several civilizations um, before Atlantis basically, the and even some yogis could, can do it now, some very, very advanced yogis. And certainly some of the Tibetan monks, with very advanced Tibetan monks, could used to be able to do it. Um, I mean, 500 years was, was simple, really. It was, it, was, it was much higher than that. They could go for, for thousands of years if they wanted to, if they chose to do so. I mean, don't forget that working on the earth is particularly hard and difficult and constraining. So why would we want to live here 500 years in this, in, in this even though... Uh, we've been in, in a virile sort of teenager's body. It's still pretty limiting in terms of what it is. So when we're at higher frequency, we're able to tap into higher functions. And those higher functions are the manipulation of energies. And that manipulation of energy uh, allows us to uh, refresh or remove s certain levels of programming associated with the gross physical. And that means you could perpetuate the length of time the various cellular structures exist uh, without degradation. Um, higher frequencies also meant that we were relying more on the energies associated with the chakras rather than gross physical energy, such as you know, veg vegetables and, and meats. And so the, the, the human form was purer then. And so ma maintaining its form for longer than its current three score years and 10 um, was quite simple. Because we were operating on a higher frequency, we were also on a higher frequency and we can manipulate energies as well. And, they, and the energies of the human form were also manipulable. So that's, that, yeah, that, that's a, it's a long time ago, but it's still possible. But we're, we're still, we're, we're, because of the lower frequencies, of the ambient lower frequencies of who and, what, who and what we are, it's difficult for us to increase our bandwidth to be able to communicate with our true energetic selves and the environment that our true energetic selves exist within, or even source, let alone be able to um, be so creative that we can not only manipulate the longevity of our form but create create things from nothing by, by, by reassigning the molecular structure of of that which is air into say a tree or, or into say a, a seat for instance because those things are also possible okay next question in page 481 of the history of god the source describes you, that's me, as somewhere near being awake. <laughs> Am I awake now or still somewhere near being awake? If you are still somewhere near being awake, are there any human beings who are, gen who are genuinely awake? Um, I still classify myself as being somewhere near being awake. Um, and with the, um, the continuing persistence of being in a lower frequency environment right now, um, everybody who is somewhere near being awake has struggled to stay at that level. Some have dropped down a bit, and I feel that you know, at times even I've dropped down a bit as well. And that's and to, and to keep at a level of, of, of awareness and awakefulness and frequency um, whilst the frequencies around you are dropping is particularly difficult because these things drop down in a very slow and, and very comfortable way so that you don't realise that your frequencies are dropping down until you've you fall asleep. It's a bit like getting hypothermia, you know, you, or, or even having a lack of, lack of oxygen in a room. You suddenly start to fall asleep, but you don't realise you're falling asleep. And the falling asleep in this instance is the lack of awareness and moving back into the totally immersed human being state. So we're all affected by it. Um, and I know that there's going to be a time when I will be significantly more awake than I am now. But now is not the time. I have a role to play with the work I'm doing now. The work I'm doing now clearly is to help educate others to experience what I'm experiencing and to progress further and hopefully beyond what I can do currently. And also to provide the um, information that's going to support the expansion of, 
understanding and, 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 and to support levels of sentience that can work with and understand and absorb the, the, the greater detail and depth of detail behind the greater reality. And, and that part of that is the books. And so um, that's going to be on being told around my 65th, 66th year because I've got uh, five more books to do and one of them is going to be about healing, one's going to be about the OM, um, one's going to be about more, a little bit more about the origin and then I've got one that discusses the religions and how they relate to my work and how, what their source is and how, they, and how we can work with them. And the other one is about the Antichrists, different Antichrists, people such as um, Hitler and Idi Amin and all those other individuals who are classified as being totally evil, where the world is, uh, works together against them and what, what the whole point of those is. So basically, this answers question five in The Origin Speaks, where uh, the O says, is he's receiving information from Source Center 12, this is very interesting. Then, I meant, then you, which is me, mentioned a possible book on the horizon, then O agrees with you. What might this book be named, and when in the sequence of books you're, you're going to write might it come? This is going to be book nine, okay? Uh, book eight is going to be about um, healing processes, but not just energetic and vibrational healing, but psycho-spiritual healing, and understanding how we incarnate in the various different forms of incarnation, and how our psycho-spiritual programming affects us physically, as well as, as, well as uh, spiritual physically as well and, and how, how we can work with that. Um, the, the, so that's the eighth book, and, and it's, all there in, it's all there in my head because I'm, I'm, I'm doing this work every day, so it's a, just a case of getting down and writing it. Um, the, the ninth book will be called Beyond the Origin, okay? And that is going to work with the sort of thing that Source Sensity 12 is working with in just going beyond the, the volume of space that is currently the, the first zone, first of the 12 major zones I'm being told uh, obviously there's 12 zones within, of the, of the current area of, or volume of polyomniscient sentient self-awareness that the origin is now currently mapping out. Okay, so the book with the origin is going to be called Beyond the Origin, which is not specifically beyond the origin, but beyond its current area of polyomniscient sentient self-awareness. Well, that's the end of the questions. Thank you very much for all these questions. Um, very, very diverse and searching and interesting. And... Uh, very nice to be able to answer, and sometimes challenging to be able to answer as well. Okay, so the next uh, part of this is a meditation to help to repair, replace a, a, uh, an organ um, within the human form. Okay, now, what we'll do is we'll go into meditation first, and I'll explain a few, a few details first to explain the concept. So if you can find a straight backed chair and sit with your feet flat on the floor with your small of your back in the sort of right angle part of the chair where the, the base of the chair and the, and the backrest of the chair meet and you keep your head straight, neck straight, hands paced palm uppermost on the upper thighs, just about where the thighs meet the lower body. and with your eyes closed and focused on the location of the spiritual or third eye which is almost in the same location as the spiritual or third eye chakra these things are two separate things okay general location though is in between the two eyebrows and above the the bridge of the nose and what i want you to understand is that the human form is created through the use of, t of 10 frequencies. Three of those frequencies are gross physical, four of those frequencies are spiritual physical, or the melting pot between the lower frequencies and the higher frequencies, and three more of those frequencies are basically a step down function to allow the higher frequency energy of our aspect or soul that's projected down from the true energetic self into a, a vehicle to experience lower frequency environment, i.e. I. an incarnate vehicle. So 10th, 9th and 8th frequencies act as a step down function, allowing connectivity with the true energetic self and, and minimal 
necessary connectivity with the, with the vehicle we're using. And so for this work, we'll only be using the gross physical energies and the spiritual physical energies. Now the spiritual physical energies, in my understanding, can be classified as um, the astral levels, if you want to call it that. I know that popular spiritual physics classifies just the fourth frequency, the astral, as being the astral levels, but it's, it, my understanding is it's, it, it, there's, there's f another three frequencies to used to create the astral levels. And so the first three are the gross physical levels. They're associated with the first three chakras, the root or base chakra, the um, other two chakras such as the uh, solar chakra as well. And the, I missed out the second chakra, okay. Fourth chakra is the, is the astral level, fifth chakra, okay, is the throat level, sixth chakra is the spiritual third eye chakra and the seventh chakra is the crown chakra. They're also associated with energy levels, okay, from the etheric level up to the cathartic template. But don't worry about these names, okay. Don't worry about, don't worry about the names of the chakras, we're not interested in working with the chakras right now. Don't worry about the names of the levels, just know them as different frequencies. Fourth frequency can be classified as the lower astral, fifth can be classified as the upper lower astral, Sixth frequency can be classified as the lower upper astral, and the seventh frequency can be classified as the upper astral. Okay. So, when we repair something or replace something, we have to repair and replace whatever we're doing on all of these seven levels because these create the human form. Okay, again the 8th, ninth, and 10th frequencies are the basic step down function. So we don't, need to, we don't need to work with those, but we do need to work with the other ones. So to repair, I'll deal with replacement in a moment, but to repair, let's say a liver, we need to move ourselves onto the first level. Now, what I'm going to do with this satsanga is send a copy of the chakra opening exercises for those who haven't done this before, um, because opening your chakra or a chakra will take you up to that level associated with the work you're going to do. So if you want to work on the second level, you use the second level, you open the second chakra. If you want to work on the third level, you open the third chakra. And, vice, and, and same with the rest of the chakras as well. And so for me, it's just moved myself to a different level. But for the people who've not done this before, you can use the chakra open exercises first to start to learn to get yourself to these levels and then you can do the work that I'm going to describe now. And I shall attach this to the, the recording, um, or should I say the transcript papers as well. So if we want to repair a liver, we have to get ourselves to the first level by opening our first chakra, our root chakra. Second being, the second chakra is the sacral chakra, by the way. I forgot to mention the actual name of the sacral chakra, but we don't, don't worry about that, of course. So we look at the liver whilst being on the first level. And if we see anything that's, that's damaged there, okay, we simply clean the area by visualizing like silver energy or silver light in the area and just cleaning the area out totally, removing any lower frequency energy that's there. And
and then rebuild the area by simply visualizing it uh, like, like a matrix being recreated. So I like to go from like north to south creating all these matrix lines and then east to west creating all these matrix lines and then from front to back creating all these matrix lines, creating a 3D matrix that allows the energies associated with the damaged area to re-coalesce on that level and create a whole representation of that liver on the first level. Okay, so we can do the same thing on the second level. So we take ourselves to the second level by uh, opening our second chakra, by extending it and rotating it clockwise. Again, the chakra opening exercises attached to the transcript wall will help with this. Okay. And again, we look for the damage on the second level. Now you'll notice that when you find damage on an organ, that it's slower to do the work on the first, second and third levels than it is on the fourth, fifth, sixth and the seventh levels. Things get faster the higher frequency you go to. So you might take a bit of time to repair the work on the first level, but take less time on the second level and then take even less time on the third level. And then things tend to start to happen really quickly on the fourth, fifth, sixth and seventh. So again, on the second level, look for the area of damage. Clean it out totally by introducing this silver light. If you think about plasters, plasters have silver oxide as part of them to help remove and destroy bacteria. Okay, silver is a very good um, steriliser. Okay, as is garlic, of course, but it's also nice to eat. But, but in, encompassing the area in, in silver light also removes any damaged air, damage and cleans the area. Once you've done that, create this matrix going from north to south, east to west, front to backwards. That seals the area and allows the energies of the healthy liver to migrate into the area of damage and reform a healthy liver on the second level. So we go to the third level, again extend and rotate your third chakra, your solar chakra. And again clean the area of damage by flooding it with this silver light. Just know that the silver light is going to remove any damage and any, any lower frequency energies and repair the area leaving it bare so that when we put our matrix in there and we go from north to south creating these matrix lines east to west and front to back we create all the structure to allow the liver to re repopulate the area and create a healthy liver on the third level and so we can do the same thing on the fourth level Again, flood the area with silver light. Ask it to remove and clean that area of damage. And when that's happened, again, repopulate the area with this, this three-dimensional matrix. This is three-dimensional from an earth-based perspective, not a, not, a, not a spiritual perspective. Obviously, dimensions, in my understanding, are much higher pieces of structure than what mankind thinks dimensions are. What mankind thinks of dimensions are actually frequencies, in my understanding. So create the matrix from north to south, east to west, and front to back, and allow the energies of the liver to populate the area, creating a whole liver on the fourth level. So let's go to the fifth level now. Again, extend and rotate your fifth chakra, your throat chakra, to get you onto that level. Clean the area with your silver light, silver energy to any low frequencies are removed or damage removed and then again populate the area with your matrix going from north to south, east to west and then front to back. Or from top to bottom, right to left, front to back. I use north to south and east to west because it's easy to understand. 
for me that is. <laughs> okay, good, when that's done, move on to the sixth level. Again, extend and rotate your spiritual or third eye chakra to bring you up to that level. And again, clean the area of damage with this spiritual, sorry, with this silver energy, silver light. When you're happy that the area of damage is clean. Now you'll notice also that the area of damage on the higher frequencies is less and less as well, because it's a higher frequency and the, the damage that occurs in lower frequencies is more profound on the lower frequencies and less profound on the higher frequencies. So you might visualize, what you're, what you're visualizing might be a, an area of damage, like a contusion for instance, or a cut, that gets smaller and smaller the higher up the frequencies you'll go. This is normal, this is to be expected. Don't think you're visualizing something wrong if you see the, the wound or the damage getting smaller and smaller. It's quite, it's quite normal and quite natural and it's correct. Again, so once you've cleaned the area with this silver energy, again, create your three-dimensional matrix by creating these lines going from north to south or top to bottom, okay, east to west or right to left and front to backwards and allow the liver to populate that area and, and fill it up, making a healthy liver, healthy whole liver on the sixth level. And then finally, you can go to the seventh level And again, do the same thing, extend the chakra, rotate it clockwise, bring it to the seventh level, and then clean the area with, with silver energy and silver light. And when you've removed any damage, the result of the silver light dissolving it, or re reduce, removing any lower frequencies, you can then populate, populate the area with this three-dimensional matrix going from north to south to east to west, front to back. And the energies of the liver will populate that, that, that structure, that matrix, creating a whole liver on the seventh level. So now you've got a whole liver on seven levels, so the whole liver itself will be perfectly repaired. Okay? To come down the frequencies, you just use your intention to stop the rotation of each chakra and it's rot and, uh, and retract it back into its normal normal size and shape one by one go from you know, doing it on the seventh level then the sixth and the fifth fourth third second and first if you follow the chakra opening exercises to explain exactly how to do this okay i always like to balance out the energies once i've done some work so i use um like a sieve if i want to call it that a sieve of varying different frequential uh, finitude and I'll bring it down from the head down to the toes just to smooth out the energies. I use one that's based upon the first level and then I use one that's based upon the second level bringing it down from the head down to the toes. Then I use one that's based on the third level bringing it down from the head to the toes. Then I use one that's based upon the fourth level bringing it down from the head to the toes. So sort of sieving out and combing out the energy so everything is in balance again in harmony. Do the same thing with the fifth frequency level sieve. You can, if you want to, you can visualize yourself being on those levels or use the chakra uh, opening exercises to get you to those levels again to use these sieves or filters or combs. Do the same thing with the sixth level, bring a, this sieve or filter down from the head all the way down to the, the feet and then finally go to the seventh level and do the same thing again. And so you've comb combed out all of the frequencies, taken out any, any area of um, what I would call scar tissue energy, okay? Filtered it all out so you've got a totally harmonious set of frequencies on all levels where, well, across the whole body, but specifically where the damage was in the liver. Okay, so that's repairing a liver. So if we go to replacing one, for instance, again, you would use your chakra opening exercises, extending the chakra and rotating it clockwise. Um, the rotation of clockwise, by the way, is as you look at a clock in front of you. I didn't explain this, but the chakra opening exercises should explain it. And if you look at a, a clock on the wall in front of you in the second hand rotating round from left to right, 
from the number 12 to the number 3 to the number 6 to the number 9 back to number 12. That's the, that's the direction of clockwise I'm talking about. It's, it's as if you're seeing clockwise from out of your eyes and looking at it moving on a clock in front of you. Okay. So to replace uh, the whole energetic template of a liver or any other body part, you have to think of the liver as being connected by two connectors. Now, if you want to think of it in computer terms or USB terms, okay, you can think of it having a USB connector on two sides, on the top and bottom of the liver. Okay? And we go to the first level and we disconnect these connections of that, that liver, either a USB connection or an RS-232 connector, whatever you want to use. Okay, I think RS-232 is better because it's got, a, got seven connections inside. So it's, it, it is connected on all levels. Okay? So you can disconnect the liver from the top connector and the bottom connector. And then basically just visualize you throwing it in a bin, a recycling bin. And then you go to the second level and do the same thing again. You disconnect this connector from the top of the liver and the bottom of the liver and put that liver into the recycling bin. So removing one level at a time, the the liver or the or the, or the or the or the organ or body part that you want to change okay so we do the same thing again we go to the third level and disconnect the connection of the liver from the top connection and the bottom connection and put that in a recycling bin okay go to the fourth level do the same thing disconnect the top connection and the bottom connection of the liver and take push the whole liver up that level into the recycling bin, go to the fifth level, again repeat the, the process, disconnect the top connection and the bottom connection, take the whole level lever, liver at that level and put it into the recycling bin and then do the same thing again at the sixth level, disconnect the top connection and the bottom connection of the liver on the sixth level and put that in the recycling bin and then go do the same thing on the seventh and final level disconnecting the top connection and the bottom connection and putting that liver which is represented by the seventh level in the recycling bin okay and then you've got a space there where the liver was so your visualization process should show you um, the body with all of its organs if you're focusing on all of its organs you know the venous system the, ner the nervous system the skeletal system the the the, the, the um, muscles and sinews system in the skin should all be there you'll be able to sort of see these things and then we just clean the area again the clean the area of the, where the liver was with this uh, silver energy just to sterilize it and then we go down back to the first level again and we ask for a new liver to be given to us at the first level and we then reconnect to the bottom connector and the top connection and then what I do is I see the energy move into that particular reconnected liver on that level and see it start to glow with energy so it's working right. And then I go to the second level and I ask for a liver that's based upon the second level to be given to me and I can connect the bottom connection and the top connection and I wait and see, these, see that liver energised and glowing with energy uh, based upon the second frequency level. So the liver on that, in this instance now is working on the first level um, and the second level. So the, the, the energy is associated with the base chakra and then the energy is associated with the sacral chakra. So we can extend and rotate the third chakra, the solar chakra, go up to the third level, ask for a liver that's based upon the third level to be given to us and connect the bottom connector and the top connector together and then wait until the energy is energised that liver on the third level and it starts to glow with energy. So then you've got the three levels together working. So the gross physical aspect of the templates associated with the gross physical form of our body is now working totally. So we can go to the fourth level then now. Again, extend and rotate your chakra to get the heart chakra to go to that level. And then ask for a fourth frequency level liver to be given to you. And then connect to the bottom connection and the top connection and wait for the liver to be energized and it start to glow. All this is perceiving it and visualization, by the way. If you don't, and well, I should have mentioned this earlier, but if you don't have, if you have problems with visualization, just use them, 
just use the mentally spoken words to achieve the same thing and, and, it, and it, that, that uses your intention therefore the intention is the same as visualization so it's, it, it does the same thing so if you have trouble visualizing just just talk your way through it and it will do exactly the same thing so okay so let's go to the fifth level extend and rotate our fifth chakra our throat chakra ask for a fifth level frequency liver to be given to us and again connect the bottom connector and the top connector and start to see the energy flowing into it and you start to glow. Okay. We can now go to the sixth level. Again, extend and rotate your sixth chakra. Ask for a sixth level, sixth frequency level chakra. Sixth chakra, of course, being the spiritual or third eye chakra, not the spiritual or third eye itself. It's just the chakra associated with it. It's only named that way because it's in the same location. The things occupy the same space energetically, so that's why it's associated with this and that's why it's called the same name or similar name. Ask for that liver to be given to you on the sixth level and plug in the bottom plug and the top plug or connector. Observe the energies flowing into it and seeing it glow as the energies start to work. Then finally we can extend and rotate our crown chakra bringing us up to the seventh level and ask for the seventh frequency level uh, liver to be given to us so we can plug in the bottom plug and the top plug see the energy is moving into it and start to glow and so now we have on the seventh level completed a complete rebuild or should I say the introduction of a completely new set of templates for a completely new liver okay this liver will not be associated with any previous damage um, that's occurred on the gross physical or any of the other frequencies associated with the spiritual or physical aspects of our human form. So the, the liver that is there, the gross physical that is there, will start to follow the, shall I say, the, the, the commands of the templates on those, le those levels, so it'll heal the liver. Okay. Again, we'll finish off by bringing ourselves down the frequencies by, by closing, by stopping the rotation of each chakra and then we, um, contracting those chakras one by one. So we'll stop the rotation of the crown chakra and contract it back its point of origin, uh, the crown chakra. And then we do the same thing with the, with the sixth chakra or spiritual third eye chakra, same with the fifth or throat chakra, same with the fourth or heart chakra, same with the third or uh, solar chakra, same with the second or sacral chakra, same with the first or, or root chakra. And then we can start to move up the frequencies again with our, our filters uh, or our sieve, so to speak, to harmonize the energies throughout the body. So we go to the first level and use the first level sieve, bringing it down from the head down to the toes to just smooth out the energies at the first level. We go to the second level, use another filter or sieve and bring it down and comb out the energies at the second level from the head down to the, the, the ankles. Go to the third level, do the same thing again, bring that, that filter down or sieve to filter out and comb out the energies from the head down to the toes or the, the ankles. Go to the fourth level, use the fourth level sieve or comb or filter down from the head down to the ankles to filter out all those frequencies. Go to the fifth level, again use the fifth level uh, sieve or comb or filter to come down from the head all the way down to the ankles and bring everything in harmonization to the fifth level, combing out any low frequency knots so to speak. Go to the sixth level and again do the same thing with a sixth level sieve or filter and bring it down from the head all the way down to the toes, the toes or ankles again, Fil combing everything out to a sixth level. And then finally go to the seventh level using a seventh level sieve or filter or comb and combing out the energies at the seventh level of finitude all the way down from the head down to the toes or ankles. So everything is now harmonious and you'll start to see everything glowing and having lots of very sparkly energy okay very silver silvery goldy whitey energy that's there throughout the whole body and again you can come down the frequencies by stopping the rotation of, it, of that chakra and contracting it back into the point of origin um, that you're on so from the seventh level we stop the rotation of the seventh chakra and contract it back into its point of origin and we move down to the sixth level and we do the same thing from the sixth to move down to the fifth and then the fifth down to the fourth etc right down to the earth level okay so that is how to 
Firstly, repair an organ or a body part, and secondly, how to replace the energy templates associated with an organ or body part to affect ultimate healing on that organ or body part that needs to be healed. Okay, so when you're ready, if you slowly come back into the room and open your eyes and take a drink of water to help ground you. And uh, thank you very much for taking part in this satsanga on the 26th of May 2018, which is held in conjunction with and in, in association with Kevin Moore and The Moore Show. And Kevin uh, is doing a wonderful job in the, in the work he's doing um, to help educate everybody in his own unique way. Um, helping to awaken us all and expand our, our understanding and our knowledge base and our consciousness with the, the use of the more show and more talk. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you all and God's love to you all. Source is love, origins love and looking forward to working with you on the next satsanga which will be, I believe, on the 30th of June, right at the very end of June. Just checking to make sure. I think it's the 30th of June. So very quickly, just looking at my calendar, just to check. And it is, it's the 30th of June. Okay, so again, thank you very much for listening to this satsanga and uh, namaste and blessings. Blessings.